It is just a special treat to be with Pastor Glenn and all of the team here, Nick and just, you know, Nick at night and all, all of the team <laughs> here at HTC. Uh, as you know, Connecticut is our home. We lived here 18 years. This is where we, we uh, started a ministry and, and really have our roots deep into the, the heart of New England, New York, New England. Albany uh, was spent some of my childhood years uh, growing up in Albany and so uh, this is really just our favorite spot here isn't it Candace it, it this is just such a wonderful wonderful time I would come just to listen to you Pastor Glenn you're such a great teacher and I, I've <laughs> gleaned from your anointing come on no golf clap You have such anointing and worship and, and the, the, the uh, just outstanding, outstanding ministry here in this corner of Connecticut and, you know, bordering on New York. And it, it just, you guys are just doing so good. I, I hope you'll let me dote on you for just a moment because uh, I, I can't think of a, a better church than Harvest Time Church. You guys are just so blessed. And if you're looking for a church family, you found it. Behold your pastor. <laughs> pastor, behold your congregation. And uh, may, may you fit right in and jump right into this sweet, blessed fellowship, koinonia of shared life in Christ that's happening here at Harvest Time. And of course, hello to all those watching online. Thank you for tuning in around the world. I know we have friends uh, in many locations that are watching tonight, and we're so thankful that you joined us. Now, um, I, I come with a very specific mission tonight, and uh, it, I won't keep us past two or three, but I, I do have some things that I, I feel like I'm, I've been commissioned to do tonight. You know, there are some people that went, and others are sent. I am sent here tonight. I have a very clear word I want to bring to you, and... Um, it has to do with your, your, his, your destiny, not your history, your destiny. So, Father, I pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to come upon us. Let piercing light come into our inner being until we have no place to hide behind the excuses of unworthiness. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to just basically say up front that I want to share tonight about you are called of God. That every one of you have a divine calling on your life. Before I get too wound up, I want to quickly mention. Um, I have a calling on my life right now to, to finish the translation of the entire Bible. How many books in the Bible? 66. Yeah, I've got 55 more to go. <laughs> so uh, I, I feel like I have, uh, you know, longevity. As long as I, I may drag it out. Those last few books I may drag out a little while, <laughs> Pastor Glenn, but... But um, because of a divine encounter, I was given this commission to do that. You don't take it lightly. You don't take it half-heartedly. You don't just set out and do that. Like uh, I got an email from some person. They said, you know, do you have permission to do that? You know, so I understand where, where all of that is because it is the Word of God, and there's nothing more sacred to me than the Word of God. I've given my life and our ministry to translate it into the Kuna language and to preach it for years and to see people's lives grow and change because of the Word of God, and now to have a, a, the privilege, the incredible privilege, many times in the morning, I, I try to get up at four and, and put about six hours in or so uh, as I'm able, and, and then my brain melts and I have to go do something else. But, um, but many mornings I just weep before the Lord as I see the secrets of the Lord come unfold in front of me. It's just so amazing, and I, I, I won't hype it, but I want you to... Pick up a copy on your way out of the book of John. That's the newest release, the Gospel of John. Anybody like Jesus and, and the story of Jesus? You know, John's one of my favorite Gospels. I love it. Uh, I have over 500 footnotes in here that uh, scholars and pastors and many teachers have told me that it, it's, this is why they get it, is for the footnotes. You know, I have the name of the woman at the well that might interest you. Uh, I have a very clear footnote on why the, the 
our, our Jewish friends told uh, Pilate that they had to take the sign over Jesus' head, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, why they, they insisted that he, take that, they, that he take the sign down because uh, the first letters of those four words in Aramaic was YHWH. So there's some stuff in here that I don't think you'll find in a lot of other places. And, and uh, just how we handle logos, the Greek word for logos, and some secrets that I know will bless you. If you're a, a lover of Jesus and a lover of the Word of God, then uh, jump in and, and uh, get into the book of John. Is there somebody here tonight named John? Is there a John here tonight? <laughs> Phil is John? What? You just want it really bad, don't you? Have you got this yet? Okay, John, come up here. If, you'll, if John alias Philip will come up here. Bless you, bro. I love this man. Give him a hand, would you? Okay, have it memorized by tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I got a call from Walmart the other day, and apparently the, the Psalms, Passion Translation, got in the hands of one of the top. They did not name who it was. I, I assume it was a Walton member of the family, Walton family, but somebody got a hold of it and uh, got to uh, Anderson Merchandisers, which is the company that handles all of the purchasing for Walmart, and said, tell this guy we want it. So they got a hold of me, and they're going to be putting... Psalms and Proverbs in a joint uh, edition is going to go into thousands of Walmarts and Sam's Clubs of the Word of God by Christmas. So we're hard at work at it right now, and uh, maybe I'll show you the cover. It's, the cover is stunning, the, the artist that has done this for us. It's Poetry on Fire, Psalms and Proverbs, and it's really going to rock our, our culture. I was just in, uh, we were just in Korea with Bill Johnson, Dr. Peter Wagner, my friend Cheon, and we dedicated the Passion Translation Korean. And they now have the Book of Psalms in Korean, and uh, Proverbs is being translated as we speak. And here's the cool news, it's now going into Mandarin as well, Mandarin China, the Chinese people, the Mandarin speakers are going to have a brand new translation. So this is really birthing some kind of a movement, it's going to go in Spanish, French, Portuguese, and some other languages as well. I can't wait to see the entire world become lovers of God. I'll tell you who, who are the people that are going to shake the world, it's people with passion. God doesn't use depressed, lukewarm, lethargic. You know, let somebody else do it. Here I am, send them. Here I am, send my sister, you know. He's going to use people that are so passionate, they won't sit down and shut up. They're going to get up and speak. They're going to share the word of God. They're going to go to the nations. They're going to race to the cross, be the first one to find the glory of Jesus Christ and reveal it to the nations. Passion is what's going to change the world. There, while we're here tonight, there are people who are passionate about taking our culture into darkness. And it's only going to be the fire of holy passion that's going to hold up a torch in the dark land of ours that will reveal the light of Jesus. So get the passion of God in your heart. And if you, you so choose to read the Passion Translation, that's great. People have all kinds of questions. I'm not going to get into that at this point about, uh, you know, who do I think I am to translate? The answer is nobody. Uh, who gave you permission to do this? Uh, visitation from Jesus. Um, how dare you do this and you're not a Hebrew or Greek scholar? Uh, granted. Uh, but um, I'm doing it as a, an obedience to the call of God on my life. And that's what I want to share with you tonight. Obedience to the call of God. To go to the nations, to be the people God has called you to be. Would you turn in your Bible, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. I want to go after a demon spirit that's been molesting you, that's been harming you. And this demon spirit is called disqualif disqualification. It's the spirit of unworthiness, false humility. There's a number of names for it. But it's the feeling that uh, you are not the one God is going to use. I want to say to you, with the authority of the ascended Christ, you are the one God is going to use to bring his glory to the earth. You are going to be a lightning rod of his glory. You're going to be an outlet, a dispenser, a container of the Christ, a dispenser of the divine. You are going to be so full of Jesus in the coming days. 
you are going to leave your disqualification outside the door and you're going to no longer walk in an unworthy, I'm not good enough, who do I think I am? Uh, all of those weird lies of the enemy are going to be crushed under your feet. Is that okay? You know, I don't know much, but I know this from personal experience that I have had to face disqualification in my life. Uh, you know, I, I, I went to Bible college and I... I Barely made it through high school. When I say barely made it through high school, I mean barely made it through high school. I think my whole family went, I can't believe the guy, you know, uh, made it. And I could go that, I could tell you stories. I don't want to do that because it may get back to my grandkids. They're not that far away and you may end up telling them and they really think their granddad's nice, so I'm not going to tell you all the naughty stuff. But got out of high school with a, a D, D plus average or whatever. I mean, Guys, barely. And here I am going to go study the Bible and go to Bible college. And, and I, I just felt so unqualified. The first few weeks after my conversion, I had a 100 kids sitting at my feet wanting me to teach them. I wasn't any older or smarter or any more special than any of them. But for some reason, spirit dropped on me. And I looked around and people were like listening to me. And I thought, I'm so, the only thing I know is John 3.16. So I taught John 3.16 for weeks until they said, could you learn another verse? You know, could you talk about, and it just, I saw God move. I saw him over, overcome my handicaps and overcome my disqualification. And then we end up getting through Bible college and I graduated the highest in the class. I couldn't believe it. I found a passion. I found something that I wanted to study and to give my life to, and it was the Word of God. And then the Lord begins to stir us to go to the tribe and to the jungle. And I thought, I am not a, one of those guys. I mean, I'll live under the stars if it's five star, you know. I'll live under the five star. Four, if I'm in a good mood, but to go into the jungle, dude, this is like dirt. This is like, we had running water. You took a bucket, you ran to the river, and you ran and got your water. That was our running water. We had no flush toilet. I mean, we had no diet Pepsi. We had nothing of that. And uh, I got sick so many times, and, and I'm thinking, I don't want to go. Uh, I, I feel so disqualified, and I struggle with my inner and even secrets that I couldn't even tell my wife at times because of this, this feeling that I wasn't good enough. I wasn't the one. Somebody else has got to go and do this, God. I had a good friend that was a Greek scholar, and he just rebuked me to my face and said, you have no business going to, to translate the Bible if you, don't, if you don't have at least a doctorate in Greek. And just like pointed his finger, pastor's, like slam their desk and say, get out of here. You have no right to take your wife, your pregnant wife and your two kids. You're going to take them out of the jungle. And all of that just kind of like, I'm sorry, but it, it, it hit me. It touched me. And I, it, it touched the nerve inside of me that says, I'm not good enough. I'm not qualified to go and, and be a tribal missionary. But I had to shake that off more than once. This, the inferiority, the sense of there's got to be somebody else around here. I mean, you guys look so qualified. You Like, Lord, send all the nice Greenwich people. They're really nice. And the ghosts of your past haunt you, and they come up at times at the worst moment. Things you thought were long gone, they were only dormant, and they bounce back up, and thoughts, and, and mind games, and go, God... So I get through my 20s and, and wrestle those, those issues of disqualification. And then there we are. We get off the airplane, a jungle airstrip and a very, very small uh, airplane designed for tribal uh, ministry. And we get off the airplane and we go down the riverbank and we get in the dugout canoe and our first sight of the jungle village. And I go, Mommy! Oh! It's like, and our partners left us. And we had nobody with us there for a while. And it was my wife and I, and, and our kids were separated from us in a mission school. And all of these things just kind of crowd in. And, and the people told us, you might as well go back home. Just leave us. We don't really care about this thing you you're telling us about. But we kind of like stealing your stuff. But we don't really like... The, the stuff you're coming. It's coming against, it's threatening our worldview and our demonic hierarchies. 
and uh, you know, under mosquito net at night, sweating in the middle of the night, that, that thing would come over me again. I just feel so disqualified. And then the day came that I could preach the gospel in, in the Tulekakachun in, in the in the language of the people. And I preached Jesus Christ, and I felt so unworthy, but I did it anyway. And, and, and before my eyes, before my eyes, this village got converted. And in spite of me, not because of me, in spite of my frailties, my weaknesses, my imperfections, the, the touchy thing that would come on me at times when I was tired and hot and, and cranky and, and all the people were all just trying to take everything inside of us and around us from us. And, and I just, I overcame by the blood of the Lamb, just like you do. And I'm not saying my life is necessarily any different. I'm just trying to get you to understand what I'm going to share with you for the next six hours are things that I've had to walk through to this day. And the blood of Jesus has become my confidence. So let's look at the first five verses, 2 Corinthians 3. It says, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are that letter written on our hearts. Known and read by everybody, you show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Wowsies, is that a good refrigerator verse right there? Such confidence is, as this is ours through Christ before God. And here's the verse that we had written on our prayer card. My wife and I, when we went on, we called it deputation. Is that, is that a word you're familiar with, Pastor Glenn? We were uh, 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 missionaries on deputation. We were deputizing people to, to pray for us and, and help us financially. We hereby deputize you to support us, you know. And we put this verse on our prayer card, and it still means so much to me to this day. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence, our adequacy, it comes from God. For he has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. We are competent because of the blood of Jesus. And I really value all of the, the identity teaching that we've had in the last decade, and maybe even longer. The Lord has really blessed the church. The body of Yeshua has blessed the church with good teaching, heartwarming, heart-filling teaching about who we are in Christ. I mean, it's just amazing. And I, and I am like, I'm a hope missionary. I'm a missionary of hope. That's my message. That's my life message. Who we are in Christ. You know, we, we are the perfect counterpart to the Son of God. We're going to be, we, we marry up into the kingdom. We're, we're part of this heavenly celestial triune glory explosion. And here we are, lifted up, seated in the heavenly places with Him. But here's what I want to say. All of this preparation, I believe, by the Holy Spirit is so that we then will take this identity and take this strength of our competence in Christ and go and do the work of the kingdom. So tonight I'm going to, uh, challenge may be a strong word, it may be a little too strong, but tonight I'm going to encourage you to lay aside every disqualification of your life. Everything that says, I can't do this. I'm not able to do this. I, I, there's somebody better that can do these things. And we're going to lay that aside once and for all. And before you leave, we've already locked the doors and nobody gets out until you can acknowledge before Almighty God, you are a competent minister of the new covenant. Not just you're in Christ, you're the head, not the tail. Let's do something about it, baby. You're going to be a minister of the gospel. Hey, you know that you're already called and ordained. I do a lot of ordinations. That's part of our 
our deal, I guess, and, and uh, I love that. I, I totally love ordaining uh, ministers and helping churches get, get going and that kind of stuff. But, but you know, John 15, 16 says that, uh, that he has called us and ordained us to go and bring forth fruit. So I'm called and ordained already to fruitfulness. Because the will of God is not ministry. The will of God is fruitfulness in a relationship with Him. The will of God is not a location or a vocation. The will of God is an overflow of a relationship with Him. You can be in the will of God in a messed up job, in a messed up family, in a messed up, messed up financial situation. You can be in the will of God if your heart overflows with love for Jesus Christ. You can die next to Jesus and be in the will of God. You could just, you could just come into paradise. You know, today you'll be with me in paradise. That, that echoes in my spirit many times. I wake up in the morning and he says, today you can be with me in paradise. I like that. So I have learned the secrets. I have learned the secrets of crushing like a grasshopper the inferiority that says, who do you think you are? You have no right to, oh yeah? The Bible says I have a right to be called the Son of God. John 1, 12, he gave the right to become children of God. So I have the, the right to do the king's business. You know, there was really nothing special about Elijah. In the book of James, it says that Elijah was a man of similar issues. Uh, similar issues or like passions, depending on what translation. I haven't got to James yet, but I'll do my best to handle that properly. But James tells us, the New Testament apostle James says to us that Elijah is so much like you, you don't even understand it. Now, if Elijah is, is so much like you, then that means you're a lot like Elijah. And if you're a lot like Elijah, then you could tell the heavens to open at the will, will of God and word of God and the rain would fall. And you could tell the heavens to stop by the revelation of God and the heavens would cork up by your command. That's what Elijah did. And he has the same issues, James says, the same disqualifying issues that you think you have and yet God used him now when we go to Israel this year we pastor Glenn and I and whoever all of you actually that come thou shalt come thou shalt come as we go to Israel we will go to Mount Carmel and see the place where the fire fell the guy f called down fire I mean this is amazing do you think you could call down fire the only proper answer is if God tells me to. Okay, let's, let's practice this. Do you think you could do the works of Elijah? That's right. By the word of God, by the word of God, miracles can happen. Uh, I've told the story. I, I, I don't need to get into the depth of it, but, but the Lord gave me a word in a city called Providence. What? couple hundred miles from here, 180 whatever distance it is, gave me a word to tell the church fire. He was going to send fire to that church. I brought the word. What happened? The church lit on fire. The moment I said it, the third time I prophesied it, fire ignited that church building. And uh, 250 people ran out, like their jaw dropped, like, my God, what just happened? I can't believe what I just saw. And the reason I know it was God is that they didn't take the offering. The, the fire just drove them all out. Nobody did the offering. So I, I'm convinced signs and wonders are going to come by a generation that will do the will of God. The Lord is telling me that Harvest Time Church is about to impact the globe. You are about to have a global impact. And this is a lot more than what your ears are hearing. You may have to hear this a time or two before you're going to get this. But this church is going to be known around the world. God is going to give you a global impact. Some of you are underwhelmed, but that's okay. God is going to use you to touch the nations. Malaysia, Indonesia, 
Kenya, Israel. We could go right down the line. I see South America. I see mi pueblo. Mi gente. South and Central America are going to be impacted by harvest time. I believe sermons, teachings, services, and worship events from this house are going to be live streamed, as they are already, around the world. But multiply it times about a million. Now, when is your doubt going to be trashed? Can I take you past the land of doubt for a moment? You need to move the horizon. You have a false finish line. It's not where God has intended for you to park. There is limitation on this church that I'm going to break this weekend by the name of the Lord Jesus in His strength and His power. Financial, we need to get phase two finished. We need to move forward as a church. And, and before I leave tonight, every one of you, I'm going to challenge you. I guess I'm doing it right now. Uh, you're going to get a passport. Thou shalt get a passport because you're going to the nations. Did you hear me? You're going to impact nations. I mean, even if it's Canada, bro, you're going to impact some nations. A, eh? get up there and, and just bring the glory. There's something about the Harvest Time community that is so drenched with the Holy Spirit, more than you realize, you're going to be able to go to the nations and carry something fresh, real, and powerful. You have a global impact. You're going to have an increasing global impact. And Pastor Glenn, you as well are going to be known as a man that carries the presence around the world. I think of Gideon. You know, Gideon was a, a, the least likely. Actually, all of the 12 judges, you know, the 12 judges, they, they were, uh, the book of Judges, the title of the book of Judges is a poor translation. To call it Judges is the wrong title. And uh, the Passion Translation will try to do a little better job. Because what comes to your mind when you think of a judge? That's the wrong uh, meaning of the word. The word for the book of Judges is the word deliverers, daybreakers. It's the word used in Obadiah 21 where it says deliverers will come from Mount Zion. It's the same word, judges. God is going to raise up deliverers. And the 12 deliverers of the Old Testament have a counterpart in the New Testament. It's the 12 apostles. The, old, the, the book of Judges is the apostolic book of the Old Testament. It's the book of Acts of the Old Testament. Okay? All 12 of those judges, bro, they all had handicaps. They all had disqualifying issues. Every one of them. Not a one of them had a perfect bio. Their resume wasn't that great. I mean, Shamgar... Shamgar. First of all, dude, you'd have a lot to overcome if that was your name. <laughs> Shammy, you know, uh, what'd they call him? Hey, Shammy. <laughs> Yo. Shamgar's not even a Hebrew name. He apparently was a mixed breed or a goyim. Or he was somehow he identified with Israel, but he was not a Hebrew by virtue of his name. And the only thing it says about Shamgar, listen, he delivered an entire nation with a stick. He's a nobody with a stick. A nobody with a stick decimated the army of the Philistines. You're not understanding that. A nobody came out of nowhere, had no right even to the covenant of, Hebrew, of uh, Judaism. This guy came out of the shadows, and all he had was an ox goad. It was a stick that he would use to poke the rear end of an ox to get it moving. That's all he had. And nobody did what he could with what he had in his hand. And this is what you're going to do. Don't say I'm too old. Oh, dude. How old was Caleb when he asked for a mountain? When he took a mountain? Moses was 80 when he led the people out of his, uh, Egypt. 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the wilderness. He, 40 years to be somebody, 40 years to be nobody, and then 40 years to show how God takes somebody who takes a nobody and makes him somebody. Did I say that right? Sounded good the last time I preached it. <laughs> I 
You're not too old. And you're not too young. Say, oh, I, I, I'm too young. I don't have this. I don't have that. L let me tell you, do you have a name? And do you have a hand? Yeah. Then take what's in your hand, your faith, and move a mountain. Yeah. Do what God is calling you to do. Yeah. It's great to, for me to tell, tell us, and I, I love to do the kissy Song of Solomon stuff. I mean, dude, I, I will, I'll do that. Love it. But if we'll just take the kiss of God, but we won't understand that it imparts, that it releases something into us. So Gideon, angel pops in. Visitation by an angel. And the angel says, Gideon, you mighty man of valor. Gideon goes, And he repeats it. Mighty man. Of, and then he says, go in this your strength. And he goes, go in this. What's this? What? What strength? Go in this your strength. I am with you. The strength we have is the one who's with us. The divine calling is the one who's with us. The anointing is the one we're with us. The gift is the one who's with us. The ministry we have, it's... The measure of the one who's with us. So all you have to do is say, here am I. Send me. The Lord is saying, who will go for us? There'll be those that will go for a paycheck. There'll be those that will go for what they can get out of it. But who will go for us? The eyes of the Lord, Second Chronicles 16 isn't it? Second Chronicles 16, 9. The eyes, the roaming eyes, the roaming gaze of heaven is peering into the hearts of his people. You, me, each of us to look for those who are devoted. The devoted ones so that he can strengthen and he can use them. Go in this, your strength. That you will go for me and I will use you. I want to give you five things I never want you to forget. If you forget... Pastor Glenn's going to have to bring me back next year and go over the same thing again. Number one, the Lord can and will use you. Tell the person next to you, even if they're quite a ways away, look over at them and tell them the Lord is going to use you. I, I just, I'm struggling tonight just uh, emotionally with, with this message because it, it just goes back to the root of my calling, my wife and I. I mean, we were just hippies. We were Jesus freaks. I mean, we were, we were like, you know, LSD to G-O-D, you know, the whole thing. And we were 60s children. We were, we were like just far out, man. We were so far out. We didn't know where we were at times. And... And then suddenly we get confronted with the gospel. This beautiful man named Jesus. That we saw him as a revolutionary. We saw him as one who overturned the religious structures and systems that would just refuse to keep the traditions and broke taboos. And he was just a, a bold, innovative, spiritual champion that would lead us. And by the masses we came and we followed and we got baptized and one by one, many of them fell away, but my wife and I continued. We went into the flames further and further until we, all we could do was say, God, use us. We said that over and over. I know I'm echoing Pastor Glenn and everyone that loves Jesus. You've said it before, but we just said, Lord, use us. If you would just use us, God, we don't want to make a dent. We want to make a difference. We want to change the world. We want to impact something. You know, and, and at that time, our whole goal and vision was that we could go where the gospel had never been and we could pioneer and take the blazing torch of salvation and put it in the hands of an indigenous people and say, there you go. You are now part of his kingdom. 
And that was our vision. It was our passion. And it drove us into Bible college and into missionary training centers and into our linguistic training and a jungle camp training and all of the years of preparation, a year of pastoral internship and doing all we did in our 20s so that we could one day go and preach the gospel to be used of God. There's nothing like it. It's the sweetest high there is when you visit someone in the hospital and pray over them and you know God used you. When you took the hand of a hurting, grieving friend and you just looked them in the eye, you don't have to give your platitudes. You could just, you could just touch them and leave and know that God used you to strengthen, to encourage, to bless them. Man, to be used of God. Now that I'm 40, I want that more than ever. I want to be... I want to be used of God. I, I, I want my life, I want it to be spilled out. I think of my best friends that were killed in the jungle. I think most of you know the story. We were missionaries, and then our village was overrun by Colombian uh, guerrilleros with a drug cartel, a really dark forces. It was more than drug cartel. They were hooked into some pretty deep witchcraft, and they came in with automatic weapons. God had already spoken to my wife and I with an audible voice telling us that we were to return to North America. And uh, we picked the best missionaries we could find to replace us there in the village. And they, they, uh, they later were kidnapped and killed and their bodies strewn in the jungle. And to this day, their bones have never been found. But they were killed. I want to be used of God. If I could leave you with this, that God will use you. God will use you. God will use you. If you'll offer yourself, don't wait until you think you're better. Or you got this. You know, dude, listen. There's so many single people that say, man, when I get married, oh, oh wow, God's going to use me. Guess what? You get married. You go, my God, why did I do this? And then the married couple says, oh, when we get, you know, if we could just have kids, we got to have kids. Oh, we have to have children. And then the kids come. And you say, oh, we have to have a babysitter. <laughs> and then you think, well, when are the kids going to leave? When are they going to go to college? Or, you know, I kind of like my basement back, you know. And, and, and they leave. And you go, when are they going to call me? When are they going to come home? We, we always live this other time. We live, you know, now is the time. Now is the day. This is the throbbing moment where God can use you and set you apart and anoint you for the gospel. Anything that says, well, when I retire, or when I get more money, or when I have trained, listen, you don't need a thing but a willing heart, a surrendered heart to God. The reason I'm bringing this message to you is God told me he's going to use this church. And you're going to have to be willing, every one of you, to be used of God in this coming revival. A global move of the Spirit is going to come out of this house. And it's going to touch many nations. Number two, I'll try to make it quick because i got a really cool ending. <laughs> you know, I should teach homiletics someday. What do you think, bro? No. Keeping it real. Okay, number two, God can you Okay, first one, what was it? Okay, don't forget the second one or I have to come back and do it all over again. Number two, God will use me just as I am. Just as I am, without one plea. God will use you. He delights to use weak people because that's all he has. He's looking for a weak person, he doesn't have to look very far, that will yield his or her heart to, to the Son of God. Aren't you glad it doesn't say, let the weak say, I am weak? <laughs> I think that's what's been going on in the church. The weak are saying, I am weak. But the Bible says, let the weak say, 
Yeah, we borrow our strength. We live a borrowed life. Everything we have isn't ours. We borrow it, bro. And, and it's all given to us in grace. We have a full package. We have not just salvation, but we have the strength of ministry. We have the strength of our calling. We have the ability to impact people in, in school and in the workplace and in our neighborhood and our community. And I believe uh, another word that I have for the church, uh, I'm kind of blowing it all here on Friday night, but, but another word I have for this church is the, is the Lord is telling me that he's going to give you a very unique burden for Greenwich, for this very community, and you're going to have an opportunity to influence the entire uh, town or city. Well, I don't know what it is. Town? Yeah. Town. Okay. You're going to have the entire, op you're going to have an opportunity to influence Greenwich. And that means a lot more than what uh, it looks. Uh, politically, economically, spiritually, you're going to have an open door to touch Greenwich. It's like you're such a regional church, but God's going to put a fingerprint right here to bless this community. Number three. God will use you where you are. You're in the perfect place. The messed up job. Work for a jerk. Don't like the people you work with. When am I going to get out of this? When am I going to get a promotion? When am I going to get something I really, uh, salary I deserve? Let me say to you, my friend, you're in the perfect place. You do not need to change location to be used of God. You do not need to move to another place or find another job or get another wife. No, no. You can be used of God right where you are. Everybody say, I'm in the perfect place to be used of God. Now, put your hand over your heart and say, help me to understand what I just said. Yeah. So that means no griping aloud but thanksgiving in all things. We thank the Lord for the boss. We thank the Lord for the weird office staff or, or whatever, uh, and I don't mean the church, I don't think. But, but wherever God places you, it's the perfect place. Number four, God will use you more when you love him more. God will use you more when you love him more. The more you love him, you know, love opens all doors. Love has the ability, the, the, the ability to endear you to people. It has the ability to feel what other people feel and, and to connect to them heart deep, to get heart deep in the lives of other people. And when we love genuinely, fervently, truly, with a pure heart, doors fling open. You see, you don't ever chase after ministry. That's, that's so juvenile. If I could say that, you know, I see a lot of young guys trying to do that. You, you never chase after ministry. Ministry chases after the lovers of God. People will beat a path to your door if, if they know you love them. If they believe you care and really love them, they're going to listen to the words that come out of your mouth and they're going to receive the impartation you give to them. Love opens the doors of ministry. The more you love, the more you're used of God. Number five, God will give you all you need to be used of God. This, this is so cool. Let me, let me try to say it real quick. God will give you what you need to be used of God. To break it down, He gives you strength. He gives you anointing. He gives you opportunities. He gives you open doors. He gives you the very words. He gives you the vision and the ability to articulate it. He strengthens you. He anoints you for what he sends you to do. And when it's all over, he then rewards you. He gives you the reward for what he did through you. Dude, that's the kingdom. What a king. You get the reward for what he does. He shares his reward with you. He did it all. All for Jesus, you know? Not that our sufficiency is in ourselves, our adequacy, but it's in Him. We're competent in Christ. So I'm just, I'm just at a loss for words how God can take a nobody and use them. And the one holding the microphone is an example tonight. You know, may it be said at my funeral or on my grave, stone. He wanted to be used of God. I don't know to what extent I am or am not, and that's not really for me to worry about, but my passion is to do the will of God. I want to tell you a story. 
to true story. And this thing is so powerful because it's true. And, you know, truth's always more powerful than Hollywood. It's about a monk named Telemachus. 400 AD, there was a Christian monk named Telemachus. Telemachus was very short, and it was written of him that he was, you know, short and jolly, that he had the most congenial, friendly, everything about this endearing monk was, was winsome, and he, his whole life was wrapped around three things, praying in the monastery, reading his Bible, and tending his vegetable garden. He loved to pray, he loved to read his Bible, and he would love to go out and tend his vegetable garden. Day after day, month after month, year after year, the monk named Telemachus found his satisfaction in the monastic lifestyle. And then one day, God Almighty spoke to a monk named Telemachus. And he told that monk these words. Go to Rome. I have a work for you to do for me in Rome. This was so startling to the monk named Telemachus. He felt so inadequate. I mean, what would it be like to leave this comfortable monastery, leave his vegetable garden, and go to this wealthy, decadent, bustling capital of the world, Rome? But because he was unable to shake the voice that spoke to him, he decided to do what God had told him to do. So he set off for Rome, and he made the journey, the long trek to Rome, and finally he came in to Rome, and he saw with his own eyes the massive city with, with a seething mass of humanity, people everywhere. He'd never been to a city. He saw things he'd never seen before. And by and by, he was swept up in a crowd going down the streets and the byways. And it's like everyone in the whole city was headed one direction. And the monk named Telemachus got swept up in this crowd and was walking along with them until he saw something he could never imagine. He saw the Colosseum of Rome. And along with the crowd, he went in. Thousands were gathered in the arena to watch men kill each other for entertainment. And one after one, the focus of the gladiators was to come and stand before the emperor. We who are about to die salute you, O God. And they would go into the arena with their sword and shield and in mortal combat, man would kill man for entertainment. One after another fell, and finally the monk named Telemachus could not take it anymore. He ran down to the rail of the arena, and the short monk climbed up on top of the rail and stood there and shouted out for everyone to hear, In the name of Christ, forbear. In the name of Christ, stop this. Nobody paid any attention. The raucous crowd was too fascinated by the men slaughtering one another. And again, another gladiator fell, pierced and dead. Another team went out. The monk could take it no longer. He jumped into the sand of the arena. And he made his way out to the center where they were clashing swords against each other. And he stood before the two of them and said, In the name of Christ, forbear. One of the gladiators took his shield and knocked the small monk, knocked him away with his shield and went back to their combat. Telemachus could take it no longer. And he kept shouting, in the name of Christ, stop this. And it amused the crowd initially, but finally one man shouted out, run him through, kill him. The gladiator that shoved him aside took his sword, went to the monk, stuck it into his heart, and then slid him right down to his waist. As Telemachus fell into the sand, his last dying breath, in the name of Christ, forbear. 
The sand turned suddenly crimson around his corpse. Deathly silence fell on the Colosseum. Finally, a man stood up at the top, turned his back and left. A woman on the other side stood and left, and then another, and then another, and another, until the entire arena, the entire Colosseum was emptied. And from that day forward, there was never again in the Colosseum of Rome the bloodshed of man killing man. A monk named Telemachus, one man heard the voice of God, heard and did what God told him to do. One man changed a nation. One man shifted a culture. One man, one woman can do that here. There's someone here tonight. There is someone here tonight that is going to change the world. And it's you. Why don't you stand?